Good afternoon and welcome to the Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Glenda Rogers and I'm going to be your facilitator for today's session. Today we have with us Dr. Tan Cummings and she's going to be talking with us about the dementia journey and uh, in the beginning. And this is a two-part um, presentation. So this will be part one uh, today and then part two, I am assuming, will be next month. So watch for that second part if you are joining us today. Our session today is being sponsored by Vitas Healthcare, and Vitas Healthcare provides uh, hospice care all over the country. I'm kind of looking at a map here since Candace is not with us right now, and they are in Texas and Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio. They're also in California, um, just all over the United States. So what I would like to say is that we appreciate their sponsorship of TAM sessions, and we appreciate the work they do in hospice care. You can find out more information about VTOS by dialing toll-free 800-723-3233 or visiting their website at VTOS.com. And I'll put that information in the chat box also. So thank you, VTOS, and thank you for providing hospice care. Uh, let me tell you just a little bit about Dr. Tam Cummings before she gets started with her presentation. She founded her company in 2009 with a mission to inspire, educate, and empower dementia caregivers. Now her professional gerontological practice in the Texas Hill Country is recognized as one of the leading educators of dementia caregivers and program design for dementia care nationally. Tam, welcome to the session today. Linda, hi everybody. Um, thank you, VTOS, uh, for sponsoring us. Thank you, WellMed, for what you guys do. And uh, God bless our hospice people, Linda, as always. Yeah, for sure. So, <clears throat> Linda, today we're going to talk about the journey in dementia. And when I was first asked to develop this, um, really started thinking about how it would be a one-part uh, session. And when... Uh, I finished, it turned out that there is the part that happens before the diagnosis happens. And so that is really where the journey begins and where a lot of the inspiration for this came from was from family caregivers talking about what their experiences were as they tried to get their person diagnosed, as they tried to figure out what was happening and just really how we're not set up to do a smoother transition from a family member recognizing a loved one has cognitive impairment or cognitive challenges and actually getting them into care. So uh, what we're going to do today is talk about uh, those things. And there tend to be, and oh my goodness, this may be the PowerPoint where everything is going to open with a curtain. So please prepare <laughs> yourselves for the very dramatic PowerPoint we're doing. So when I looked at research, it, there, there are five themes during dementia care, uh, beginning with getting a diagnosis, then the time that you do management for your loved one at home, the transition into long-term care, uh, the time around the end of life, and then the grief that occurs in bereavement. But what I couldn't find in research was where anyone was looking at what happens to the family before, oh my gosh, it is, it is <laughs> the curtains. So yay, that's what I get for duplicating a cell over and over again. Yeah. So as we get started thinking about your loved one with dementia and the journey that you're on, it begins with, it's so very complex, Glenda, because families have changed. Not only have we changed uh, that sort of Americana view of mom and dad and they're married for 70 years and then each of the kids are married and they're only married one time and divorce doesn't happen to where it is today where we have a very blended families. We have, uh, one of my sisters has children from three different husbands. So I have nieces and nephews who are half siblings of one another and families are just all very complex, all very different. And Glenda, you know, from your background and your history with the Area Agency on Aging, 
that every family's got a drug addict, every family's got a black sheep or 12, every family's got somebody abusing something, every family's got a grandkid they don't trust. And there's nothing that any family can tell professionals that we haven't already heard or we don't have in our own family. So one thing is to realize is that the families have changed. And along with those, have been family dynamics that have changed. Uh, in the beginning, when we think about how our lives were, it was just this and everything stayed within the family and what was in the family stayed in the family. What happened in Vegas stayed at Vegas. Family secrets were kept. And there was no such thing as reaching to outsiders for care. And also you have to remember, Glenda, before World War II, 97% of our country was rural with very large families because you needed large families to work, uh, to do agricultural work. And 3% of our families were in urban areas. And after World War II, those numbers almost completely switched. And so part of the family dynamic that we've seen change is all the family may not live in proximity to everyone else versus my family where one ranch joins the next ranch joins the next ranch and you can always find a family member but even that is slowly going away as more and more of my nieces and nephews for example move further away from where my family originated that makes sense glenda yes absolutely people are becoming more mobile for sure and then every family's got this guy <laughs> Now, when, when you and I were younger, this was uh, J.R. Ewing from, from Dallas, and everybody's got this guy. Um, even families that think they've got everything, there's this guy. Uh, if you'll remember, about a decade ago, a billionaire was in the news after he went to court and was convicted for stealing money from his billionaire mother, even though he himself was also a billionaire. So, you know, anything can happen in any family. Every family's got this person, little weasel sitting there in the background. Do you know the most abused prescription medications are our grandparents, our elders? And it's because they got the best stuff. They got painkiller stuff. They got narcotic stuff. They got stuff that will make you feel good. And the biggest access to drugs that you and I are not supposed to have is somebody getting them out of their grandparents' uh, medication. So every family, we've, we've got to be careful for this. Now to Glenda, to somebody who is an only child, and as we think about the dynamics of caregiving and we think about the dementia journey the, the family goes on, when you are an only child, it is a different construct. It is a different journey. Now to an only child, this looks like three siblings fighting. To people who have siblings, this is clearly three siblings having a discussion over who was supposed to bring the phone charging cord. So it looks different, the dementia process, based on whether you're one of a group of children or based on whether you are an only child. For an only child, it is certainly in many ways more challenging, Glenda, but in other ways, you also aren't having to argue with siblings about what you believe is the correct movement forward in terms of care for your loved one. Sorry about the curtain, y'all. And then for the adult child, there is the point where you realize that there is something terribly wrong and nobody will talk about it. And if you try to go up to your healthy parent and discuss it, you may find yourself rebuted, shut down, shamed, because nobody talks about what to you seems like something so obvious we need to address it and fix it, but you find yourself uh, running up against a wall like, and suddenly the very response of the parent who's not sick with dementia makes you feel like you're that little kid again, that you're being shamed or punished, that you're being grounded, that you're just being shut down because they, after all, are your parent. And I think, Glenda, I'm still afraid of my parents. If they called right now and told me to do something, I would go do it because they're my parents. And so for the dementia child, it's, it's very, very difficult. In the beginning of stages two and three and stage two, 
Remember stage one is us, we're aging normally, we're the baseline for the staging tool. Stage two is called mild cognitive impairment. Stage three is where the term dementia is used for the first time, it is considered the beginning of dementia. The person needs minor assistance with housekeeping and transportation and are usually pretty good to let you help out with that. And you notice that something's wrong, and you try to get them to the doctor and you get them to the doctor and the doctor tells you there's nothing wrong. And part of that is because the doctor, if they listen, are giving them a test called the MMSE, the mini mental status exam. And the problem is Glenda, the MMSE was developed by Folstein and Folstein in the seventies and it's an orientation test. It was designed that if you fell down and hit your head and we took you to the ER very quickly, they could determine that something else was really wrong with you because you weren't able to orientate yourself to time, date, and place. So people with dementia on average can pass the MMSE five years longer than if they were given a test like the SLUMS test, the St. Louis University Medical uh, Mental Status Exam. It's, you can Google it as SLUMS, S-L-U-M-S, or the Montreal, or the MOCA. If they were given those cognitive tests, they would fail. But instead, the doctor says there's nothing wrong. And then there's another thing, Glenda. If I went to any general practitioner and said, my big toe hurts, where would I be sent? To a specialist, probably. A podiatrist, yeah. Mm -hmm. If I said I got a spot right here, I'd be sent to a dermatologist. If I said my heart feels funny, my back hurts, my shoulder hurts, I'm nauseous, I'd be heading over to a cardiologist, lickety split. But for some reason, if I or you or the person with the issue says we think there's something wrong with this loved one's cognitive function, suddenly every general practitioner is an expert in dementia. And even neurologists have to specialize in dementia to actually understand it. And so frequently the family member gets the person to the doctor and the doctor tells them there's nothing wrong. And so years can pass, Glenda, waiting for a time to act while the family is trying to understand the disease. But the problem is if you Google dementia, you get billions of hits. And so I try to explain it to families is trying to figure out dementia on your own is like trying to understand how an automobile works, but you don't know the term internal combustion engine. Uh -huh. But you found all, all about tires and doors and air conditioning, but you haven't been able to process and get down to what is the actual issue because you don't understand the function of the car. And most people don't understand the function of the brain. So for some families, they're literally waiting for a catastrophe to happen so that their loved one will get in a hospital and get examined by a variety of doctors through a traumatic event. And that's really, really hard and horrible for the family. Stage four of dementia is called moderate dementia. And this means that more assistance is now needed with mobility and protection. This is a person who may be beginning to give away money, refinance the house, uh, leave the house in the middle of the night, let strangers in, give the drugs away, not take the medication correctly. You know, Glenda, I got a call one day from a lady and I'd never spoken to her before. I answered the phone and without saying hello, she began to scream, my husband forgot to tell the doctor he's having memory issues. Mm, mm. And I said, ma'am, I, I want you to write that statement down, read it out loud three times and then call me back. And I hung up the phone and she apparently wrote it down, read it out loud, called it back. You're beginning to do more and more and more for them. And as you do it, if you point out what they're doing wrong, you're going to get a lot of pushback because the brain doesn't recognize it's damaged. And in stage four, the person's lost about four ounces of brain tissue out of a three pound brain and they can still drive a car. They still can go to work. They can do so many things. But then there's that glitch that can happen. This stage four is beginning to have trouble telling stories, telling jokes if they were a joke teller. There's a longer and longer vacancy 
in their eyes when you look at them and talk to them. They're more agitated in stage four. It's as though they can tell something's wrong, but they can't hold on to the thought long enough. It means that the hippocampus in the center part of the brain is under attack. The person is more agitated as we think maybe they can feel that their brain's not working right, that stuff that should come to them like this isn't. And when humans don't have their brain work like this, Glenda, it does make people very agitated. So moderate dementia, the family notices this person is beginning to get more and more easily agitated and, and may even say and do things that seem totally abnormal for them and out of character. And so you get them back to the doctor. And again, the doctor says to you, the family caregiver, there's nothing wrong with them. And Glenda, how many times have you and I had a family member tell us that the doctor then said, it's not that person that's sick, it's you. Yeah. I cannot tell you how many years I've known families that told me how they were trying to get their loved one in for care or for help to the point where they were finally told there's nothing wrong with your loved one. You obviously have a mental condition. It's a terrible way to be reminded that you're right, isn't it? Mm, very. So even in spite of what the doctor says, you know there's still something wrong. You realize that your loved one is repeating themselves over and over. They call you 20 times a day at work and they've never done that before. They would never bother you at work because work is important. They don't remember things. They make lists over, excuse me, over and over and over again. And Glenda, you know, I hate to say making lists because how many people are list makers? That does not mean you have dementia. You're just a list maker. These are lists of things that they should know. Their address written over and over again. The names of their children written over and over again. Their phone number written over and over again. And then neatly folded and put away. Um, it's not unusual to find toilet paper taken apart square by square and folded, the tissue taken out of a box and folded and put away. So we don't understand this, but you're seeing these things happen and you know something's wrong and it doesn't matter what you do, nobody seems to be listening to you. In severe dementia, which is stages five, six, and seven, stage five is called moderately severe, stage six is called severe, stage seven is the bedbound stage, it's called very severe dementia. Families and caregivers are now having to do everything for their loved one, including turn them in bed if the person has lived to stage seven. And it is typically only here that a diagnosis is made in this country. As your loved one goes through this and they begin to have behavioral problems, 50% of the behaviors are untreated chronic pain. So if you know your loved one has arthritis, you better check and make sure they're getting routine daily arthritis medication. Arthritis, Glenda, tends to fall off the diagnosis page as the person goes from the hospital to a rehab to home back to a hospital diagnoses drop off. So if your person's hard of hearing, people need to know that. If they're already vision impaired, people need to know that. And you need to understand that these behaviors are being caused not because this person's mean, they're being be caused because of brain damage. And 50% of the behavioral issues that we see in a person with dementia are untreated chronic pain. Linda, I have osteoarthritis. I hurt every single day. It's just some days I hurt a whole lot worse. Mm -hmm. And every single day I take uh, medication for arthritis. And on certain days I take extra. But if you go into a dementia community and look at their medication, you'll see that it's PRN. And PRN, Glenda, means I have a three-pound brain. I know I'm hurting. I know you're my nurse. I need to come find you, ask you for the medicine. You'll give it to me. So you've got to educate yourself as you're going through this disease process. And yet, where do you go to get that information and how do you use it to provide the best care for your loved one? Because you still haven't got them to the diagnosis part yet. And as time goes on, you notice that that vacancy in the eye is beginning to happen more and more often. And that vacancy in the eye is there for a longer and longer period of time. Linda, a lot of times I hear from families that they haven't noticed their loved one has dementia. It's only happened the last three weeks or the last three months. And 
dementia is in place usually 10 years before I get called. Dementia is usually in place at least 10 years before the family begins to look for outside care, begins to go to conferences, begins to try to find more detailed information on their loved one. And it's in this point that you begin to notice that vacancy in the eye that's there. So go back on your phone, Glenda, and go back 10 years and pull up the face of that loved one and blow the face up until it fills the entire screen and then look at them in numerical order and you'll see that 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 shot at the anniversary where you thought you were both smiling, when you go back and really study the picture, you'll realize that your loved one wasn't smiling, they were just standing there. And so the photographs will help you see what you thought you were seeing and that it's true, that this is something that is slow and insidious, has been in place for a while, and you're not imagining anything, it's just the challenge of getting your loved one to diagnosis. Does that make sense, Glenda? Yes, it does. At the same time, there is wear and tear on the other parent who may not acknowledge or discuss with you what is happening, even though that's your parent. And the reason is the dynamics of marriage. That's their marriage, and they may view this as none of your business. Or the other parent may be seriously ill. Three out of 10 dementia family caregivers die before the person with dementia dies, and it's the direct result of the stress of trying to do care for a person with dementia. If your person is in stage five, you're doing the work of 12 professionals. If they're in stage six or stage seven, you're doing the work of 16 to 18 professionals. The stress of care is what causes the death of the caregiver, and three out of 10 is, is incredibly high. And then finally, Glenda, you got your mom or dad to listen to you that, that we've got to deal with the other parent and you got a doctor, you went, you found a real neurologist who knows what to do or a dementia testing center and you found out the doctor will see you in how many months. And that becomes its own issue because every single day your loved one gets worse, their dementia continues. They go to sleep tonight with fewer brain cells than they had this morning. And then you finally get into the doctor and the doctor may or may not do the correct diagnosing. And if they're still using the MMSE and now your loved one has failed the MMSE, it's too late for the medication. The medications were intended to be started in stage two or stage three, maybe stage four. But in our country, Glenda, most people aren't diagnosed until stage five of the disease. And by then the medication just draws out the worst part of the disease for two to three more years. And as you're waiting to find out what's actually happening with your loved one, you've noticed that she's just getting worse bit by bit by bit. And now there's medication she's supposed to remember. In a Texas nursing home, the average person is on 27 medications. In a Texas memory care, the average person is on 18 medications. Once you go past three medications, you're running the risk of medicating for the side effects of medication. And Glenda, a lot of times people think that the cardiologist is looking at the rheumologist, who's looking at the dermatologist, who's looking at the general practitioner, and that they're all looking at each other's medicines and working together, and that's not happening at all. You've got to have your pharmacist check your loved one's medicines periodically to make sure there's not interactions happening because specialists don't talk to one another your doctors don't talk to one another. Falls are part of the disease of dementia. Everybody with dementia falls. It's not that they're not trying hard enough. It's brain damage. Their brain goes from weighing three pounds to weighing one pound. And that's why they're not able to do or be the person that they used to be because the brain is what holds the personality, who you are, and all the information about your life. In terms of driving, <laughs> Linda, we have something <clears throat> that you know of where instead of the neurologist or the doctor saying, I'm sorry, you have a dementia diagnosis, you can't drive anymore, and we're going to fill out a piece of paper and send it to the Department of Public Safety so your driver's license gets removed, we tell people with, they can go to a certain hospital and learn to drive again. And yet we know people with dementia can't learn anything, and they've got brain damage. Why would you want them driving? 
Mm. A woman actually called me one day and told me she was making her husband drive because she had noticed he had lost his confidence driving. <laughs> it was, oh my God, lady, you're crazy. <laughs> He's not safe to drive and he recognizes he can't react to stuff. Things are scaring him. And instead of realizing it was brain damage, she thought she was helping him. They're not safe. They're not safe at home. Would you leave a 12 year old at home? Would you leave a person at home with brain damage? And yet you don't have the access to the information that tells you, no, your person is no longer safe to be at home. And then there's the monster under the bed, just trying to get someone to talk to you and tell you what's going on. And meantime, Glenda, the number one way people describe their loved one is that their loved one is slowly becoming a shell of who they were, and that shell is being broken. Your loved one may even be doing bizarre or dangerous behavior that they don't remember doing. One of the things I do, Glenda, when I go up to a house, uh, when I'm seeing someone at their home, is I'm looking at their car as I'm driving in. I'm looking to see how many nicks and scrapes and bumps and scratches are on it. And if you ask the person with dementia, they'll tell you that somebody down at the parking lot at the, at the grocery store is hitting people. They're the person at the grocery store hitting people and they don't remember doing it. They don't understand how they're driving and they're not able to follow the speed of traffic. I've been in the Northeast uh, in December, I was in the, in the North speaking and what was driving me crazy, Crazy Glenda was every speed limit was 35, 45, or 55. And you and I live in an area of the country where there's a couple of roads marked 85, but everything else is 75. It felt like I was going putter, putter, putter down the road. Yeah. And still I passed someone. And when I looked at them, I was completely sure that that person driving had dementia because of how they looked as they were driving and because of how they were driving. As the family caregiver, as the adult child, you may have had angry conversations with your loved one over something that they did or keep doing because you didn't understand it's brain damage. And that's a normal thing. If a person gets diagnosed with cancer, Glenda, they get sent to the cancer center and then the cancer doctor sets them up with the cancer social worker and the cancer social worker sets them up with the cancer support group. And all of these things happen at once. But if it's dementia, nobody gives you any information. And so you have a tendency as a human to correct someone when they do something wrong, to point out that you just did that thing wrong, except people with dementia don't know they're doing anything wrong. And every time you point it out to them, because their brain says nothing's wrong, all you're going to do is make them mad at you and make for a very unpleasant day. You have to remember there's a stigma of dementia, and that can stop you from being able to get the proper diagnosis, the proper help, or to get your loved ones to realize that there is seriously something wrong with your, with your loved one. I had a, a young man in, um, I want to say Chicago, tell me that the real reason his grandmother wouldn't get up and walk is the memory care community she lived in was coddling her. And I didn't know his grandmother. And I said, well, the reason she doesn't walk is brain damage. And he said, why would she have brain damage? She has a dementia diagnosis, which brings her brain is dying. The type of dementia tells us the way the brain is going to die, the order in which the lobes of the brain will die. But he didn't understand that dementia means the brain is dying. And so he really thought if the professional caregivers would be mean enough to grandma, she'd get up and walk even though he admitted she didn't walk at home. There's a stigma of dementia among your parents' friends, among friends of a certain age group. They may disappear, what the kids call ghosting you, because there seems to be a thought that dementia is normal aging, and it's not, right? It's a disease of aging, but not normal aging. Most of us will age with a normal functioning brain and never need help, but there is a stigma of it. And people are scared of it. And I don't want to come over and be at your house because he's there and he has dementia and then I could get it too. So there is a stigma attached to dementia and your loved one, because of brain damage, may do or say things socially that are inappropriate 
and embarrass you or make you angry, but it's brain damage. It's not anything that's happening on purpose. Glenda, you can have friends who ghost you, and then you can have friends that reappear. One of my friends suddenly noticed that her mother was very upset every day when she talked to her. And she kept talking about her husband and where was dad and why hadn't dad come around and maybe he was cheating on her and just all these terrible things. And my friend did some research at the community and what she found out was one of her mother's old friends had discovered where she was living and every day called her at 10 o'clock and every day spent a half hour explaining to her that your husband died two years ago and here's what you had on at the funeral. So you have people that come in and out of your loved one's life that can make what you're trying to do even worse or even harder because we are in their reality. If they think it's 1970, we think it's 1970. Does that make sense, Glenda? Absolutely. No reason to torture people like that. Hang on, I lost my cursor. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about the curtains. <laughs> Because you don't get support, you can begin to think that it really is you. And then because the answer isn't definitive, you can begin to think, well, maybe it is something else, especially if it's vascular dementia, because vascular dementia people may appear normal for hours or days on end before another blip happens. Then you are maybe angry because there's no help. And then anger, because why doesn't the doctor do something? So you finally get to the right doctor and the doctors, well, maybe not the right doctor, but you get to a doctor who tells you that uh, it's not dementia, it's something behavioral or it's dementia with behaviors or without behaviors, or I'm going to go ahead and tell you which dementia it is, but I didn't actually do any testing to make that determination. And then Glenda, these are the two most common things that the family is told when they finally see the doctor, and that's usually a neurologist, they're told to come back in six months or they're told don't come back. There's nothing we can do. Hmm. And can you imagine how devastating that is for a family to know there's something wrong, but nobody will tell me what this monster is that's destroying my loved one. Does that make sense? Sadly. And then for the family caregiver, you're faced with taking away the independence of your loved one. And it hurts to do that. It hurts whether you're the spouse or whether you're the adult child. Now, recognize the adult child grieves differently than the spouse does. And as part of the family dynamics now, <clears throat> the spouse doing care for your loved one may not be your parent, it may be a step parent. Or in the case of my father, step parent, step parent, step parent, step parent, step parent. So it could be multiple step parents. It may be someone that you don't get along with, that you don't care for. And it may fall upon you to push the matter to get your person to care. And the dynamics in the family can really tear people apart here, even in that leave it to beaver family. Glenda, it can tear the children apart watching their, their parent die in this way. And then for family members, there are all those horrifying moments where you recognize that in this flash of a second, for that second, your loved one knew something was horribly, terribly wrong, and then it was gone. It's important that we talk to children and grandchildren. But you have to be careful about how you explain dementia. It's best to say it's dementia, it's disease of the brain, and then which dementia it is. Don't try not to say things like grandpa's brain is sick. The reason is, Glenda, I get sick, you get sick, little kids here sick, and mama just said, I'm sick, I need to go to bed. Does that mean I'm going to die? So you have to be careful how you use words. So it's best to just have an as honest a conversation as you can with children and grandchildren because they will do better with that. And they can tell when you're lying and they can tell that there's something going on in the family. They can feel the emotions. They can feel you stop talking when they come in the room, all of those things. 
So you've got to sit down and have a family conversation with whichever group you can. And depending upon your family, that's going to be really easy or really, really hard. Glenda, you got to be careful about self-care because self-care can slip into drinking care or drugging care. And, and of course, here in Texas, where we lead the country during drinking, during COVID, um, you just have to be careful. It can be very easy to start a little self-medication and then to find out that you're out of control. So pay attention to how you're taking care of yourself as well as you try to navigate the journey with your loved one. Now, Glenda, when I looked at adult children, you and I have both in our careers run into adult children who are doing everything and into adult children. I have called somebody and said, your mother's dying tonight. And they have said, oh, I have dinner reservations. Yeah, yeah. call the girl home. So, you know, you never know what the family dynamic was. You never know what dysfunction was in the family. But in research, there tend to be different roles that if you're watching this as the adult child, you might have already begun to take on. Now, typically one of the children, if there are multiple children, will become the caregiver while the others watch or pretend that's what happened, what is happening is not real. Have you ever seen that, Glenda? More than once. <laughs> and this can be influenced by culture. Uh, Asian American, African American, Hispanic American have a much different uh, way of looking at the process of dementia than Caucasian Americans do, whereas we view a skilled facility or memory care, their culture indicates that this is a person who should be cared for at home, even though we believe this person needs medical care. So you have child number one. Child number one is the adult child that steps up and tries to take care. They realize that there is a disease process going on, that it is a disease of the brain, and that it is somehow affecting their loved one, that this is not the same person they knew, and that this person is going to need care. And they're able to sort of pull resources together internally and begin to address the situation going on with their loved one, whether or not the other parent is willing to be involved. And you got child number two. Child number two sees dementia as a disease, but instead of really making the connection that that behavior is directly linked to damage in the frontal lobe, they're just focused on the behavior of the person is inappropriate. Child number three thinks dementia is a normal part of aging, so why would anyone be getting upset about it? Child number four isn't really sure what to do and, and so isn't really interested. And then there's this child who doesn't acknowledge any difficulties at all. And what I frequently hear is they've got a family member that's in denial. And I tend to think of people in denial about dementia just as being people who aren't educated about what the disease is and what it's doing to their loved one but there actually is a group of adult children who it appears that no matter what we do are simply not going to acknowledge that there are any difficulties happening to their parent. And then throughout this entire process, the family caregiver feels guilt that they're not doing enough. And there's a grieving process that begins so that by the time the person is in stage five of the disease, which is moderately severe dementia, and when most people are diagnosed, by the time your loved one reaches that stage, even though they don't look sick physically, they're missing a half a pound of brain tissue. And for you, post-death grief has begun. And post-death grief, Glenda, means that I'm now grieving for this person as though they had already died, even though they're still alive. So you have to go back to remembering your family dynamics and remember back when you had friends. You've got to get in a support group, get a hold of those friends, 
Get in a support group, whether it's virtual or in-person meetings, because it will save your life. These are the people that are going through what you are going through right now, or they've already gone through it. They may have tips for you. They may know the best doctor in town. I tell families either look at the Alzheimer's Association for the testing centers near you or call a memory care group and ask the marketer who's the best doctor around and they'll tell you who's the doctors that specialize in dementia in your area. Now, Glenda, for you, the caregiver, these are things that are available on YouTube and these are things that you can do for yourself as you go through this disease process. On YouTube, you can go to therapy in a nutshell. This is a, a therapist out of Utah and she is brilliant. She does eight to 15 minute little nuggets of care, little nuggets of therapy knowledge that will help you. And she's got a few hundred different topics to choose from. The mindful movement does meditation and they do uh, breathing meditation and they also do sleep meditation. Um, they, uh, Sarah Raymond will talk for two to four hours, but she will talk you to sleep. Deepak Chopra is a person who is not only a MD, but also is uh, very highly thought of for his meditation techniques. And so these are all free and they're wonderful things for you to do for yourself as you start this process. Other things that we know that are going to help Glenda are journaling, writing a letter to yourself. Poetry is actually very helpful for grieving. Glenda, did you know that? Hmm. No, I didn't. You just thought it was torture from eighth grade. Turns yeah. out it's actually good for grieving. Greenstone's ice cube trick is when you feel yourself overwhelmed, go get a cube of ice out of the freezer, walk to the sink, hold the ice tightly in one hand, shut your eyes and breathe for 10 breaths. On breath seven, the ice is going to be uncomfortable and you can drop it but it will calm you down quickly because it's going to freak your brain out because you're holding something that's burning, freezing, cold, wet, and drippy. And your brain will shut down all of the windows it has open and you will instantly calm down. Be kind to yourself. Go to self-compassion.org. That's Dr. Kristen Neff's website. She's a specialist in self-compassion. Scroll down and take the self-compassion test. Now, Glenda, you know I'm an overachiever. I like to be first. I'm competitive. I took the selfcompassion.org test positive. I would make a five. Five was the highest score you could make. I made a two. Mm. Turns out I'm not as nice to myself as I think I am. And for family caregivers of people with dementia, it is critical that you find a way to be nice to yourself because of the journey that you're going through. And then Glenda, for the next one, we'll talk about getting the diagnosis, management at home, the transition to long-term care, end of life, and then grief and bereavement. Okay, so yay, I did that above time. So we have time for questions. Uh, we have one, who was the first woman you mentioned? And I'm thinking that Tanya is talking about um, who did therapy in a nutshell. I have no idea what her name is. Okay. It's just under, it's under therapy in a nutshell. Okay. So got that one. Um, and they're yeah. all on YouTube and they're also um, on podcast. If you have the podcast app, all three of those folks are on uh, YouTube or podcast, but the uh, YouTube is free. And Dr. Chopra uh, on his website or podcast may want money. So I, I stick to the 400 things he already has on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's so much there. Um, just the breathing techniques alone, if you do that, you know, as a form of meditation, it's so helpful. And you know, I've always loved the ice cube thing. It works mm -hmm. like a champ and it's so simple. Anybody oh, I have a new one. Um, oh. Okay. So this is really simple to do. Put one hand on your forehead and one hand on your heart. Shut your eyes and take a breath. And it should just instantly calm you. How does that work? Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it is crazy. Mm -hmm. did, um, you feel, did you feel it happen? I did, but I'm going, I'm thinking, 
you know, I'm a, an, I, I, I analyze things. So I was analyzing, how could that help? <laughs> but it did. Um, I see that the person that is on the telephone for Mary Co Code 210 has their phone unmuted. Would you have a question? I have a question. Okay. Yes, ma'am. My name is Isabel. Um, my mother came to live with me in September 2nd of last year. She just got diagnosed in August 5th of 21. But all I have is her regular GP telling me that she, you know, was diagnosed with dementia. She was living with my brother. He kind of kicked her out. So when I got her, I kind of am trying to figure everything out, you know, with her Medicare, with her diagnosis, trying to get her. She came for a visit and has not gone. And I really didn't know what dementia was. I do know that when I did kind of look at it, I said it was stress. So my mom's gone through a lot. My dad's been gone for about 10 years and she moved in with their mom and that relationship wasn't good. So it's been one thing after the other. I have no children. I live in um, Floresville, which is next to uh, San Antonio. Right. So um, when she came, it's just me and my husband and we live in a one bedroom one bath. So she's in my living room, but in mm -hmm. her mind, and, and as I'm sitting here, I'm kind of, you know, getting upset with myself of how I've been. But the question that I have is she just keeps seeing, because she came from my brothers who was so noisy, so dramatic, so, you know, just a lot of stuff going on over the hair. And over here with me, she hears crickets because there's it's just me. I had to quit, take care of her. And she sees children. I have no children. Mm -hmm. I've nanny 32 years of my mm -hmm. life. So I'm only 55. So, you know, to me, I've always been a sister to her. My mother was my grandmother, my dad's mother. You're, you're describing Louis Body's dementia. What okay? is that? Louis Body's dementia. It's L-E-W-Y-B-O-D-I-E-S dementia. Go to lbd.org. Okay. They'll give you uh, more of the clinical features of it. Your mother would be very sensitive to medication. Um, there are four common hallucinations. One is that they see children. Uh, they see bugs, spiders, rats, and snakes. They see bad people coming to get them. They see everybody having sex. Um, they right now have unusual falls where they suddenly stiffen and fall like a plank. They have trouble with constipation that's not related to diet or medication. Um, and it is the fourth most common form of dementia. Okay. So right now it's just the children. I think it's because that's what was her entertainment, her. No, ma'am. always been. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. No. It's a hallucination. So this is something she sees. Okay. That is now, part of what her disease. Would she be in? I would say I based on what you're saying, in. she's in stage five. Is that a bad stage? That's <laughs> a stage where she should be either in skilled care or memory care. She needs, okay, she needs and then medical how, care at this point. And what would medical care be? Because I mean, I take her to appointments. I they take are her more likely. Her. Well, first of all, they would realize that she had Lewy body dementia and, and you don't know that. They are licensed and trained to recognize delirium, UTIs. The nurses are there. The doctors come there. The dentist comes there. The podiatrist comes there. X-ray comes there. So all services come My to them. House? All research indicates that people with dementia get better care in a skilled facility or memory care because those people are trained to do care for dementia, whereas the family caregiver is not. So that would mean her living there? Yes. Yeah. And are there any around in San Antonio? Uh, there are 1,200 yes. nursing homes in Texas. Yeah. I have a suggestion, Isabel. Have you connected with the Caregiver SOS centers there in San Antonio? No, with Caregivers SOS. SOS. They have caregiver specialists there that can guide you and, and help you connect to some of these resources. And it's a program of the WellMed Charitable Foundation. And so my suggestion to you be to call um, our customer service representative and ask her how to contact these people. Uh, these caregiver specialists. And, and how far from San Antonio are you? 
she's not too far in Floresville. I'm 18, I'm 18 miles from Floresville to San Antonio on the south side. Yeah. You're how many miles? 18. 18, I think, is, is it, what's the name of the medical, of T, UT Medical there to have the diagnosis done? Um, Are you asking me? I don't know, know, right? No, no, I'm asking Glenda. Glenda knows everything. Uh, I, I think, it, isn't it out of UT San Antonio? I'll have to look it up, Isabel. Um, okay. I think it's UTSA. You're correct, Linda. Oh, thank you, Guinevere. Yeah. You're welcome. UTSA. UTSA. And then um, I would make a note. Your mother cannot have antipsychotic medication. Okay. There is a special antipsychotic made for Lewy body and Parkinson's called Nuplazid. N U P L A Z I D. That's the only thing she can have. She'd be very sensitive to medication. And when she talks about children, Isabel, what you're witnessing is her having a hallucination, and their hallucinations can last for hours. Yeah. And I just come in and I'm so upset, you know, and I just go off on her and then she'll just say, okay, you know what? I won't talk about it. I won't talk about it. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. Sometimes she'll say it's my ne great nephews or people I know, but, you know, she'll just say it's a bunch of kids and, you know, she'll start moving things around. And I, I, you know, she always said, promise me you'll never put me in a nursing home. And this is before, you know, all of this started happening. She was doing fine. She was on her own and everything. And, uh -huh. you know, that was my thing. Okay, I'll keep her. I'll take care of her, you know. I'm, I'm a nanny at heart. I, I breathe it. I eat it. Everything. That's all I've ever been. So that's all I know. And, you know, nobody else. I have four siblings. I mean, three siblings. And, you know, it's like, okay, I've just kind of like just left them alone. And, uh, you know, my husband's like, bring her with us. We'll take care of her. You know, we'll just do what we can. And then, you know, I'm trying to figure out all this. You know, I have no info and just, you know, go in as I can. And, I'm sitting here listening to all this and I'm like, I feel like crap because I'm reacting to her and I'm trying not to. And, you know, my siblings, one of my, my brother, I only have one brother took advantage of the situation. So I'm having to clean all that up and it's just so much. And it's mainly more of that. That's where my anger and my, my frustration comes with because she's always been a sister to me. I've always had to take care of her my whole life. You know, it, anything that my parents did or when they separated, whatever, she always came with me. So I'm the sister to her, you know, and she, my mother's not confrontational. She's very passive, very, you know, she'll do what you say. She's been like that her whole life. And we're not like that. We're like my dad, you know, and it's like, we're more just, Oh, you know, just stand up mom, say what you need. And she doesn't make decisions as well. And, you know, I'm sitting here. And then once you say this, it's like, okay, well, I'm thinking she's looking at him because she lived with my brother for four years, you know, the kids came in and out and, you know, yeah, they wouldn't really have, yeah, the chances are with a bunch of kids around, they wouldn't have noticed. And what you describe in yeah. your brother, not paying a lot of attention yeah. anyway. And here there's nobody. So, you know, and she'll but look me, at what know, the frustration's do, doing to you. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And yeah. I hate that. This affects yeah. marriages. Yeah. It really, yeah. really does. When you it's bring felt. a person home with you and y'all are in a small place. Isabel, is it, do I have your permission to have one of our caregiver specialists give you a call? Oh, yes, ma'am, please. I would appreciate okay. that. I I've written down your phone number and I will pass that on. And so we will get you connected. I know you're struggling okay. right now because this information is new to you and overwhelming. Um, so let me get you some help. So I will pass on your telephone number and tell them kind of the situation um, that you're in right now. And our other people are, you know, with us on the, you're on the phone today, but people on Zoom are offering support to you also. I know you can't hear them, but let me read what they are saying. Definitely get in a support group, and the SOS centers can help you with that. And uh, Joy says, you need to remember that you cannot do the job of 16-plus professionals um, while you're trying to fill the role of, and it, you know, and it is far better for your mom to be in professional care. And so I, I know that's hard to hear, um, and you may feel guilty and feel like a failure, but there's help out there, um, Isabel, so let me try and connect you to that. 
Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right, I'll, I'll pass on your phone number. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you for being so open with us, uh, Isabel. It reminds us of how desperate people get when they're caregivers and feel so alone. Yeah, but you're not alone. We're here for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, it's hard to follow that, but does anyone else have a question or a comment that they would like to make um, to Tam? If you are on your phone, you can press star six and unmute your uh, phone. Um, Emily, you have a question or a comment? Uh, yes, just a quick question as we're wrapping up. Um, what's the best resource or what's the best way to find somebody like uh, Tam in my area. I'm in California and I've been trying for a long time. My mom has dementia. She's been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, but I'm fairly certain it's beyond mild cognitive impairment. Um, so I would really like somebody, you know, to see her, somebody like Tam that can really give us that kind of assessment. So what, what are the resources or where should I be looking or who should I be reaching out to, to find somebody, um, that would see us in my area? Yeah, I'm the only one of me I know. <laughs> that's, that's true. She we is. just need more of you. I'm the only one in graduate school that graduated, as far mm -hmm. as I know. Um, I don't know anybody else who does what I do, but mm -hmm. I do Zoom calls with families all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, if you are in one of the areas I travel to, we'd make arrangements there, but you can always call me and we okay. can set up something mm -hmm. to, to go through mm -hmm. uh, what's going on with your loved one. And everybody mm -hmm. on here, um, my phone number is something I'm happy to give. I write it on every McDonald's bathroom wall. That's why you keep seeing it. <laughs> it's 254-216-3668. Uh, and you can call me anytime and we'll see if we can uh, answer questions or get you help or get you pointed in the right direction and get information to you. Gotcha. Is Do you mind saying that once more? 254-216-3668. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate you all bet. of that. You bet. I'm in Texas though. Don't call me in the middle of the night. Oh, Come I ahead. promise I won't. <laughs> California. Leave, leave a detailed message if you call and leave uh, her a message and she mm -hmm. will call you back. It may take a little bit, but she'll be back. Okay. Um, okay. Raquel wants to know, Tam, is there a certification we can see, seek out with a neurological practice? Somebody special that can do this diagnosis accurately. Where are they? Uh, where are you, Raquel? Um, She's in Austin. She's here in Austin. Oh, um, Dr. Bertelson and Dr. Winston. Winston and Bertelson. Uh huh. Adult senior specialty. Uh, Dr. Bertelson is now out of there, out of Dr. Winston's office at adult senior specialty. Um, Dr. Bertelson makes the diagnosis. The neuro he's a neurologist who specializes in dementia. Dr. Winston is a geriatric psychiatrist who specializes in dementia. Dr. Winston's practice oversees every community in Central Texas. Um, they're the ones responsible for Jerry Psych in all the buildings, and they only see people with dementia, and Dr. Bertelson and Dr. Winston are also doing one of the big trial uh, drug trials right now. So these are two of the best known specialists in the country, and they're right there in Austin, uh, right off Mopac. Great. Uh, thanks for asking that question, uh, Raquel, and for others of you, I will be sure in our follow-up email to uh, put that information, contact information, in place you're close and would like to see them, so I will look that up. Uh, Joy, did you have a question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, Tam, I've been so privileged to be following you for about a, a year or so. Uh, I met you at one of your seminars a few months back, and I just have such high respect for what you provide to the community, especially to us family caregivers. My mother has been with me in my home for about four and a half years now. And it seems like within the past month or so, her uh, things are just like really progressing rapidly, more rapidly. I would say she's probably, yeah, I would say she's probably toward the end of stage six, possibly, I don't know. Um, you know, just real simple tasks she's starting to forget. Uh, how to do things or what she's doing or what she should be doing. 
And uh, I mean, you know, it comes and goes. But she, is she losing weight? Oh my goodness. She's just really, yeah, she's. You need to uh, go ahead and ask the doctor for the hospice order so that you can get some additional care in there for you to help with her and okay. get you some support. You really want hospice in place the last year, not the last day. I, okay. I can't tell you how many times I'm at someone's house and hospice can't even get the bed there and the person has okay. died. So that's our tax dollars. It's free. It gives you a hospice nurse, a hospice doctor, a caregiver who comes to bathe your mom. So it gives you services and we pay for it. So let's use it. Yeah. Okay. I, you know, I've been feeling like she's close to the end of stage six. You know, I mean, she's still mobile, but a lot more wobbly. Uh, and we do go to the doctor in a couple of weeks. So I'll definitely reach out about that. I yeah, you have to ask the doctor for the order. And then all hospice groups do the same thing. So interview a couple of different groups. And it's the one you feel the best with. The one you feel like you have a real connection to those people. Okay. Thank okay. you for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joy. Um, the, one of our senior centers, Walker Ranch Senior Center, is asking, have you ever heard of an SPECT scan? A spec scan. Yes. Mm -hmm. It um, They introduce a radioactive dye into the person's body. The dye goes to the brain and it attaches to certain proteins and the color and placement tells the neurologist which dementia they're dealing with. Mm. Is it relatively new or it's been around a long time? It's, it's been around for a while, but in, under the Texas best practices model, it's one of the 28 tests for dementia is, is to add a spec scam. Oh, okay. All right. You've Thank seen you. it, Glenda, in a presentation I did. It's a, a picture of several different brains and the two on this end look like the two on this end. And they're uh, bright blue, orange, and red, but they're different as you look at them. And it tells the neurologist which dementia they're looking at. Ah. Yeah, well, that sounds like a useful tool. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Um, okay, we're after two. What is your time looking like, Tam, in case someone else has a question? Oh, I'm fine. Okay, all right. Uh, last, last month, Tam and I both had to leave real quick, so that's not the case. Uh, anyone else have a question or a comment that you would like to make at this time? Let's see. Uh, Guinevere. Hi, Guinevere. Yeah. You're always here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a great time this, this Christmas. I had some time to myself, so I'm good. Good, good. So, uh, for those who, who are new or those who have been on, I've been with Dr. Tam Commons and Linda for five years. And there's no way I could do what I'm doing without them. And the best thing I can tell you is get in a support group. Because after a while, that support group, you need Dr. Tam Cummins and you need Linda's Wellman. I'm a survivor. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm glad you had a good Christmas, Miss Stockett. Absolutely. Glenn I Bear. did. And I knew I'm Sam glad you back on the air. <laughs> Keep coming back, Guinevere. We need your input. <laughs> oh, I'm not going anywhere. I feel home here. <laughs> Absolutely. And we, we feel like you're part of the family, too. Um, we have another caller that has unmuted their phone. And this is not Isabel. It's uh, area code 201. Do um, you that's, have a question um, or a comment? Me. OK, yeah, please my go name, ahead. My name Hi, I'm Dina. I'm in I'm in New Jersey. Um, I did have an opportunity uh, to speak to Dr. Tam oh, months ago, and you were so generous with your time, and I thank you for that. Um, I don't expect you to remember anything particular. Um, my mom has dementia. She's bad. She's in I'm sure the later stages. However, it, it's it's kind of an interesting scenario. She's um, she can hardly walk at all. Um, her mobility is just severely compromised. However, she and she forgets everything. She really doesn't know the, who we are, her children. Her, her, often she doesn't know who my dad is, just that my dad is 
the person who is there to care for her every day and my sisters and I as well. Um, she, however, still is extremely verbal. Um, when she talks, she makes sense. She's very understandable. Um, she has still moments of, of clarity. Um, and I don't doubt the severity of her dementia. I, I'm just curious about the, um, the seesaw uh, still at this late stage. She has a tremendous appetite still. Um, however, she's incontinent. She has been for a long time um and so on so i'm just curious about the incongruity with all of these other symptoms yet her ability to be so verbal still um i've seen other friends of mine who whose parents have declined but everything has steadily declined including their ability to be verbal and to speak your mother probably has a different type of dementia than your friends do based on what you're explaining um, Alzheimer's is much, much different than vascular dementia and vascular dementias are much different from one another based on what is the cause of the vascular dementia and where is the, the damage. Um, when your mother has moments, those moments of clarity where she speaks and it, and it makes sense to y'all, celebrate that because if you'll think about it, those are becoming fewer and fewer. And what you said was... Oh, yeah when she speaks, which means that it's becoming something that's lost. And a lot of times I think when you run into families that are doing care the way you and your sisters and your dad are, and be very careful about your dad because his health would be considered quite precarious right now. Um, you pay so much attention that you catch things another caregiver wouldn't because they're not actually doing care, because they're visiting, because they don't live there. And so it's not unusual for family members to notice that their person is different than someone else. And what it means is you're either looking at a different mixture of dementia, a different type of dementia, or something about your mother's brain is different. It could be that your mother's actually smarter, that your mother's brain was more analytical, so there could be a number of different reasons for it, but when you begin to describe the challenges with her mobility and the other things that you mentioned, those are all indicative that she's getting close to the end. Yes, well, that's 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 our uh, that's our supposition. We we're we're assuming that that's the case. Yeah, and it's so, it's not thank you. Yes, ma'am. For everybody on here, it's normal for you to wish this could be over. It's normal for you to wish tonight they could just go to sleep and not wake up. Um, that's human nature. You're watching someone that you loved and respected and admired and they cared for you and you've cared for them. And it's horrible to watch this disease. It's horrible to see what happens next because every time you think it can't get worse, it does until death comes. And so it's normal to think, I wish it could be over. And if any of your loved ones die tonight, you didn't make that happen. You don't have that kind of power. But it's normal to think that that's just a, uh, to me, that's a kind human thought uh, that you love someone that much. Can I, can I say one more thing? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Um, I have found the webinars and um, support groups to be extremely helpful, as has my dad and my siblings. I... Um, I, I follow you all that just happened to come across you on the, on the, um, internet as well as Alzheimer's New Jersey and COPSA, which is, um, which is an organization, uh, out of Rutgers University in New Jersey. Um, and between the three groups, there are some amazing webinars and all different kinds of support groups. Um, and it's, it's a tremendous resource, and I so appreciate all that you, you are all doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Lori wanted to know if you could say a little bit about what you're going to cover in part two of this journey, uh, starting the journey. I've had a couple of questions on the chat about that. No, it's these five things right in front of us. Oh, gotcha. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, the first part of it is what we did today. It's that you realize something's wrong. And like Isabel, her brother sees nothing. 
the other siblings see nothing wrong. And it is the heartache you go through of trying to get to the part of making the diagnosis. For research, all I find is these five themes, but it's the, the years before you get the diagnosis, I think, that, that are so detrimental to the family because you know there's a monster in the room, but it doesn't have a name, you know? Yeah. And for those of you on the phone, the fine things that she's talking about and they're showing on our Zoom screen is getting a diagnosis, managing at home, transition to long-term care, end of life, and then grief and bereavement. So those are the five um, areas that she's going to touch. Yeah, we'll be really depressed after that no. one. Well, I had the disclaimer at the beginning of the session today that, you know, we cover really tough stuff here. Um, and you could hear it when Isabel, which just, you know, grasps at my heart, um, what people are going through. And I think that Tam does such a wonderful job in explaining things in common language, but it's tough to hear. It's so hard for people to hear. Uh, I'm so sorry, you Isabel. Yeah. Um, Let's see, Lori, did you know of any support groups in, in Wisconsin? Lori, uh, I'm in Texas. Tam and I are both in Texas, so we would not. But what I would say to you, you can find those support groups by reaching out to your local area agency on aging, and they're in every state. Um, and you can also go to the Elder Care Locator, uh, Lori, and that toll-free number is 800-677. 1116 and ask them about support groups. Um, I know there's a lot of them online now too, Tam. Uh, since COVID, a lot of things have changed. And one of the things that changed positively is the ease in getting to support groups on the internet. Um, so you can look there, Lori, um, in case you wanted the Elder Care Locator web address, because you can put in your um, zip code there and it'll tell you everything around you that might help. That is www.eldercare.acl.gov. And I'll put that in the chat box uh, or it'll come out in the follow-up email that you'll receive in a few days if you register for today's session. Thank you Another for asking thing, uh, Glenda, is a lot of communities have su support groups, of course, but a lot of them will allow you to come to the support group, even if your loved one is being cared for at home, because right. part of their mission is to educate and do care for families. So your loved one doesn't have to be in a community for you to get into the support group. You just have to call and sign up. All right. So look for assisted livings in your area, um, long-term care facilities, um, and they will offer also uh, support groups. It's important to be yeah. protected. Let's talk about support groups for a second, Glenda. All a right. support group is where I go and I leave feeling supported. I leave feeling like people understand me. They understand what I'm talking about. But if I go to a support group and it's, oh, you think your story's bad. Let me tell you my story. It's even worse. Well, that's a war story group. And that's not supportive. So you may have to find a couple of different groups before you find one that really feels good. But a good support group, these are the people that will be standing with you at the end. And that's going to be critical. Yeah. And um, I mean, we are kind of a support group. Many of our um, sessions end up being that way. And you can certainly get information here. But it's better to have, um, I'm thinking, Tam, an ongoing group that you connect with. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Anyone else have a question or a comment? I think that we will wrap it up. Uh, but we'll take one more question or comment if there's someone out there that has a, a burning issue they would like to discuss. I will we'll add a comment. Yes, go ahead. Um, even if, if you would like more information on our stress busting program, uh, give us a call at 866-390-6491. We, are, we offer that program in several states already through different area agencies on aging. And we have one caregiver specialist that does offer it 
virtually for anyone who wants to participate. That's also another helpful tool out there for you. That was Minerva. She is our support <laughs> in the Caregiver Teleconnection, and she works for Wellman Charitable Foundation, and, and Caregiver SOS is one of their programs. So did you hear how fast she did that phone number? She did, and I always have to look after all these years. I have to look at that phone number. Minerva, you're just great. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, okay, I think that it's almost 20 after now, and I think that we should would wrap this up. Um, Tam, do you have final words for everyone? And I'm going to look at my calendar and see what's coming up next. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you know, hang hang in there. You're you're really not alone. Other people have been down this journey. There are people out there to help. Please feel free to reach out. Um, if you start to bother me, I'll send you a bill. I bet you don't call me after that. But you really can uh, call me if I don't call you right back. It just means I'm traveling. If you haven't heard from me in a couple of days, call me again. You're not bothering me. I really do have a unique education and I'm happy to help you. Everything you're feeling is normal. It is normal to feel overwhelmed. It is normal to be grieving. Everything you're feeling is normal. It's normal to be angry at family members who aren't doing what you're doing, but you ultimately have to remember this is a medical disease and it, it eventually requires medical care. And you are a better caregiver when you're rested and when you're able to be who you actually are. So take care of yourselves and Glenda's available, I'm available. And if there's anything I never do, please let me know. Just yeah. hang in there, everybody. Right. And uh, Isabel, to you in particular, we have shared your number with a caregiver specialist, and she will be getting in touch with you. Um, so hang in there and wait for that call. Um, I wanted to tell you that tomorrow, oh, wait a minute. No, that's not tomorrow. It's Tuesday, January the 10th. I'm ahead of myself. I'm already getting ahead in the year. At 10 o'clock Central Time, Dr. Nestor Prodario, and if you haven't heard of him, he's, he's a very interesting person. He's going to be talking about dementia or Alzheimer's and understanding the difference. And, and Tam has covered this many times in her uh, presentations. That's just a little different take on that. And then Lucy will be back with you. Um, that's Lucy Bariluk. And she will be back on Thursday, January the 12th at 10 o'clock Central Time talk about life after caregiving, and she's going to have Dr. Pam Orzek with her talking about that topic. I've enjoyed being with you today, and thank you so much for joining us, and I know we had a couple of new people. I hope you've gotten something out of the session today and will join us again in the future. Uh, as I put in the chat box, we don't have a date yet on the second part of this session, but watch the uh, Caregiver Teleconnection calendar and emails. And it will be posted there. Um, so I think it's I, the first Thursday, isn't that, Glenda? Well, that's what I'm thinking. But sometimes, you know, we get a little off schedule. So watch for the first Thursday at 1 o'clock uh, of February. And you'll probably find us there. But watch for the calendar also. Pam, as always, thank you so much for being with us today. And thank each and every one of you for what you do. We're so appreciative. And um, we want to be here for you to help you continue in your caregiving. With that, I'll say goodbye, and I'll say Happy New Year again. Bye-bye. Happy New Year. Bye, Glenda. Bye, everybody. Bye.